Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Sue, very much. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, the book about Paul's memoir, or it's a very strange sort of memoir, as you may have read or heard about, because um, it is really a creation out of years and years of interviews he did with a very close friend of his, Stuart Stern, with the idea, possibly, of someday doing an autobiography. Uh, which for some reason in 1991, he abandoned that idea and not much was thought about it again uh, until a few years ago when all these transcripts, thousands of pages, were found in a file cabinet, uh, both in a storage facility that the Newman family has and place in their home, and they just kept turning up pages. And uh, they, it's an extraordinary document because it's certainly as close as we were ever going to get to an actual uh, testament by Paul about his life. And I certainly was lucky enough and honored enough to have the opportunity to try to put this into a narrative uh, form, which it really, based on the amount of ground that they covered, uh, was not as difficult as it may sound despite the number of pages involved there. Uh, although I dare say there are not too many people I can go to my grave saying who've actually read all of those pages in there, and uh, I feel very, very proud to be, be one of them there. So uh, as you probably have heard, I mean, there's sort of ne not a topic that isn't covered in this. Paul's childhood in Shaker Heights, uh, his uh, education at Kenyon, uh, his beer drinking at Kenyon, uh, his time at Yale Drama School, just starting to get uh, made in New York, uh, his career made here, work on Broadway, and so forth. Um, and it goes on. He talks about different movies, but more he talks about himself, about his life, about his uh, marriages, about being a father, um, about all sorts of things that he's been thinking about. Uh, and he seems to be somebody extremely thoughtful and thinking about things all the time and welcome this great opportunity to talk about it with somebody he trusted tremendously in Stuart. So I thought what I would uh, start by uh, asking Clea is, um, you've obviously gone through all of this uh, very deeply. Um, what's the one question that you were kind of surprised Stuart didn't ask him, or that you wish he had asked him? We were back in the green room, and, and, and I said, you're going to try to stump me, aren't you? And he goes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what is the one thing? You know, I'm his kid, so it probably would be something to do with, you know, if he could do, do it over again, how would he, how would he, like, what would he do? because he had so many concerns and um, regrets, I guess, in how he parented, you know, if he was present enough that he wasn't, he, f he always felt he wasn't present enough, that he wasn't um, there for us, which I don't, um, it was it was certainly hard as you know having parents that were gone all the time. I mean he was an, he was an actor so back in those days he would you know people made films they would leave for months at a clip and um, that was just his job. So I, I didn't really have a big problem with that, but I think um, I think I would definitely say like what would you how would you have changed it now? You know, if you if looking back, how would you have changed being a parent, or how what would you have done differently? And if he were standing here right now, what do you think he'd answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> What's the one thing that really uh, would have this is the, the the main thing I would have done different, or you know something along those lines? Is there one thing? you think he would single out in a conversation with you? I mean, not just anybody on the street, but with his daughter saying what he would, what he would feel bad about or feel need to atone for, if you will, as we all feel, need to atone for things, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think for him, being an actor was 
probably the demise of his parenting, as he put it. And that you know that is why he truly didn't think he was a good parent because he wasn't here. Um, but I would argue that he was incredibly present when he was. So in my in my person my personality is I would rather have somebody that was there a hundred percent when they were there than be kind of around all the time but not be really in your life and be present. Um, and he was he was surprising that way. And he gave the greatest advice <laughs> about all types of weird things, even kind of girly things, which you think a dad maybe wouldn't want to talk about. Well, he must have been intimidating to potential boyfriends, in fact, saying, you know, that Paul Newman's my father, come home and meet the folks. That can be a complicated situation there. I assume it, it was at times. Uh, well, and he could, and he would like, he liked being, <laughs> he liked having fun with it, you know? So he would, he would do things like, I'd come in, you know, with my date, and I'd say, Dad, you know, this is so-and-so. And he'd look at them, and he'd say, it's really nice to meet you. You know, Clay is my youngest daughter, and I'm very protective over her. And would you like to come and see my gun collection? <laughs> <laughs> and they would, and, you know, and they would look at them, and his eye, their eyes would get huge, and, and I would go, Dad, you don't, I don't even have guns. What are you talking about? Cut it out. <laughs> but yeah, he, he, that was part of the game, so. <laughs> what, what was it like having, when he was present and between films or when you were both living out with, the, with your family out on the West Coast before you moved to Connecticut, what was a family dinner like? Was there a lot of talk about movie making, a lot of talk about uh, just household and family stuff or, um, uh, you know, how it, it, it wasn't business talk around the table, I take it, with, with your, despite your mother and father doing the same thing for a living, as it were. Um, no, not, not, uh, not when we were all together at dinner. I mean, it was usually about homework or not doing your homework or, <laughs> you know, uh, politics. There was a lot of conversation about politics and mom and dad would expect you to have something to contribute. So even if you were seven, you needed to have an opinion about whatever we were talking about, <laughs> which, was, which was, you know, you had to get a pressure. little creative. Because I was like, I didn't read the paper. Why not? Well, I don't read the paper yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good. You know, it was, it was actually, you know, it, it definitely got you comfortable in talking about all types of things, which has been very helpful under these circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> Doing, anytime you have to do a book tour, you're ready anytime for it. Anytime I'm ready. Yeah. It's, it's great. You know, he talks in the book, in the, the, a lot of conversations about how he felt that he never had a mentor growing up. He talks about, you know, his relationship with his father was kind of distant and um, how he never really had a teacher that became a mentor. He never had, uh, you know, a religious, you know, figure who was a mentor. He never had a coach that was a mentor. Uh, and he really rude this fact that there wasn't anybody uh, that took him under the wing when he was growing up, as it were. W was he your mentor, do you feel? From what you're saying, it sounds in a way like he was giving you advice and whatnot, but it's a, it's a big role, for, even for any parent to become a kid's mentor. Do you, did you feel that way? I, I mean, I was very blessed because I, I had a lot of amazing mentors in my life. Um, and but my, both my mother and my father were, they, I mean, I was pretty wild kid, so <laughs> once I kind of got it together, I mean, I was like the perfect kid until I hit 16 and I went to boarding school and it's a little mucky there for about 10 years. And then, and then things kind of returned. a long time returned. in boarding school, the 10 years. <laughs> well, no, no, but the boarding school was kind of the beginning of uh. the end for me. But, um, but once I, kind of return to the planet, um, <laughs> I, both of my parents were inc incredible, they gave me incredible guidance and, um, and never, um, they were so inspiring, they never, 
made me feel like I couldn't do anything I set out my mind to do, which all parents do, which is an amazing thing about parents. Um, but my parents would actually, which was difficult for them because they were still working and they were gone a lot. But yet, even through difficult times for me, I mean, one of the most amazing things that both my parents did for me and then my father continued was I had a very tricky time in my early to mid 20s and so I started seeing this amazing therapist who helped me get through this time period and I asked my father and my mother if they would come you know to therapy with me for a little bit and they did but what was even more amazing is that my father was actually shooting a film and he would fly back for every single appointment once a week. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty amazing. And this was like out in the middle of the country in Connecticut. So he would fly in and then he'd get in a car and he'd drive like two hours to the, and then he would sit there for two hours and so get back in the car and whatever. And he never missed an appointment for nine months. Um, which is pretty amazing. I mean, he, that was a long answer, but that's no. pretty. It, it, and in fact, it, it, it opens another thing a bit. One of the things he talks with Stuart about, directly and indirectly, is psychoanalysis in the book. Uh, one would say, reading this, reading his transcripts, he's somebody who is no stranger to analysis and a lot of analysts and whatnot. In fact, it's very, he, he met his first shrink who, uh, he became a patient of at, it was either the Concord or Grossinger's. Uh, he was up there shadowing Rocky Graziano for the movie, uh, uh, Somebody Up There Likes Me, and he man ran into this guy at the bar. They had a great talk, and it turned out he was a shrink. And he became <laughs> his patient. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Dad would meet his first shrink at a bar. That, you know, I don't know, perfect fit. And unfortunately, the poor man dropped dead very soon thereafter. <laughs> Oh my God, I, yes, I remember reading that. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, really hit him like a ton of bricks, apparently. But it also appears that after some hiatus, he took up with a number of other analysts, including one very long term. And it sounds like from some of his talk, he was very attuned to looking at his own subconscious, to looking at his own motivations, looking at everybody's motivations and seeing things, you know, he, he really, was it a Freudian household in that way? I mean, everybody was seeing a shrink, it sounds like, of course. Well, <laughs> it's like Upper know, West Side. <laughs> well, it, well, it was kind of an interesting time because the 70s and early 80s, that was very in, in to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, everybody went to therapy. I remember the first time I went to therapy, I was like six. And, <laughs> and it was a Freudian therapist, this was in California, because like, everybody went to therapy, it didn't matter how old you are. And I remember, you know, laying on the couch, and you know, he was sitting, sitting behind me, and he starts asking me questions, and he's like, "So, you know, what are the things that you feel really bad about?" And I finally turned around and looked at him and said, "I'm six. I don't really, <laughs> I don't, I don't have problems yet. My big problem is like, you know, I'm right? it's like I don't have any problems yet." <laughs> but yes, Dad was. I mean, both my parents were were very open to it, but I think what's surprising about it is that, you know, when, when Dad and I went to therapy later, it, I think it was the first time that either one of us were actually really ready to talk about all the things that concerned us and, you know, issues that we had, not necessarily with each other, but things that we needed to talk through because frankly we're very similar, God bless you. Um, and it was, I mean it was really heartbreaking. I mean it was, you know, there was a lot of crying and there was a lot of, I mean both of us, And it, but it was amazing because as we emerged on the other side, I mean I, you and I talked about how the whole process of all these interviews were almost like self-therapy for dad. He really, he was going through this huge process and, and when dad and I went into therapy, it was right at the tail end of this. 
So we went to therapy together at that time period, and it, it's like he had done all this pre-work, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on himself, and it was a pretty amazing experience uh, for both of us. So um, I feel incredibly grateful that, it, you know, timing is everything, right? And I think I had really good timing to be screwy. <laughs> That's all I can say. Be a great title for a book. <laughs> yeah. A really good time to be screwy. Uh, there you go. It, 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 it seems to work wonderfully. A, a lot of people have commented from both reading the transcripts, reading the book, that they're shocked, public in a way, that Paul Newman had such a rich and complicated interior life and was able to actually articulate it. Uh, because that's not something, you know, be they an actor or be they a professor, you know, is necessarily particularly good at. It's very hard to talk about what you're feeling and what not. Um, did he say things in the book, really, that shocked you? Or did you hear things, even in therapy, that totally turned on its head what you thought of your own father? Uh, I would say that um, reading all of the transcripts what was most difficult for me was how hard he was on himself. Um, I mean, he had a really complicated childhood, really complicated. And the fact that he managed to get out of that at all kind of intact was pretty impressive, really. Um, and you know, he, he beat himself up, I mean, you, you know, David and I talked about this before, but it's, it, was, it was surprising to me that he kind of never cut himself any slack about anything. And I think that was the most surprising to me. And, um, but he was always striving. That was, that was kind of his temperament. He never felt like he was good enough, that he had worked hard enough, that he, you know, so he was always striving when you talk to him about his work, even you know when I was much later in life, when I was in my 30s, he would say to me, "Well, I, you know, I, I didn't really do any good work until the verdict. You know, really, all the other films, I just was, I didn't do any interesting work until then." And I'm like, "Dad, I, <laughs> really?" And he's like, "No, I really, I didn't feel good about my performance. I really didn't really start doing it." And, and I thought, "Well, that's, I think a lot of people would disagree." You know? <laughs> I think a lot but, of people do. Yeah, a agree. lot of people, right? But he, yeah, he, he was certainly, that's a theme that comes through, is how hard he was on himself, how judgmental he was about his work. He wouldn't credit himself for anything. You know, people think I'm this, you know, this great persona. He said, I'm just doing lines that the screenwriter wrote. I didn't, I didn't, I'm not these people. I'm not uh, anything like that. And uh, he, he was extremely, he was never a good enough son. He was never a good enough athlete. He was, you know, when he was in the service in World War II, well, he never actually saw action because of a variety of reasons. He wasn't a torpedo plane. And I think he probably felt, bo both felt, seemed grateful as well as, you know. He didn't uh, live up. Yeah. You know, this was, uh, you know, he knew, he knew a, a, a kid that he had trained with the first day of you know flight practice for them, the poor kid got killed in a crash, and uh, that was uh, you know a telling sort of thing for him. Though, he says he just kept going on, which was something that he did. It seemed uh, he seemed to do a lot of. He was able to just, okay, I'm going to keep going. It's like he felt lucky. Yeah, it, Newman's luck is Newman's he luck. He, he talked a lot about Newman's luck. And he talked about Newman's luck all the time, even, I mean, later in life he was always talking about Newman's luck. So well, he always said that he was born and, and won the lottery because of his features, what he looked like, which he felt also, of course, he was not responsible for either. He had nothing to do with it. And uh, so he had just gotten very lucky looking like, as he, it's a great quote, of course, he says, you know, what if I'd been born looking like gold in my ear? You know, and he made a point there. Uh, it, it was, you know, sort of something that he, I think, was really haunted by. Now, he also, 
both for work and I think maybe vanity, really worked hard keeping up that appearance, keeping in fantastic physical shape, even into a, uh, to a ripe old age, if you will. The workouts, the saunas, the swimming, you know, the, the discipline. I mean, you must have just been awed by that. Even when he was drinking, in fact, he, did, he had his disciplines. It seemed incredibly so. Well, the impressive thing is, is the one thing he thought he was very good at was drinking. <laughs> he did think he was really good at that, and he was. He was impressive. And it was interesting because he, he had a whole, I mean, he, he really did have this crazy routine. I mean, I look back on it, and all joking aside, I mean, you know, some of his drinking was really scary. It, I mean, it was. And he... Um, you know, and I think my, my mom and him had a really tricky time there for a little bit, and then she really put her foot down, and then he got it together. Um, but the, <laughs> the comical thing about it is, like, his, you know, as, as much as his drinking was, you know, kind of this, he was consistently kind of going off the rails, you know, he did kind of manage to pull it together and... Mom. Well, there's a lot of talk by people. I was with your father, or so your father, the night before, and he had had so much to drink, you wouldn't believe it. He was three sheets to the wind. And there he was on the set at six the next morning, looking oh, fresh as a daisy. That's what I was, in, that's, <laughs> sorry, that's, I totally lost my train of thought. So his routine was insane. So he would get up, no matter what time he had to be on the set, and he would get up, and he would work out for two hours before he had to actually show up every day, no matter what. And he would roll out of bed and he would put ice in the sink. I don't, I don't know if you ever remember this famous scene in, in The Sting where mm -hmm. he gets up and he fills and he puts ice in the sink and he sticks his face in. Well, he did do that. <laughs> that, was, that was real. I mean, but he did that all the time. And he actually, when I was growing up, he would take the sauna for half an hour and then all of us little girls would go down with our with our axe and break ice in the river, <laughs> and he would go and get in the river. <laughs> I have a I have this amazing Very Scandinavian. photograph of him doing that. Well, I mean, and when I say it was cold, I mean ice. You know, it was terrifying. <laughs> and he'd say, "You want to come in?" No, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> there, there were a number of people uh, commented, there's a whole section in the book, well, there's a lot of intercutting in the book of people that Stuart Stern also interviewed, close friends of uh, Paul, uh, that he empowered Stuart to ask them anything they wanted. He said he wouldn't censor them. And people actually took it to heart, it seems, a lot of it. <laughs> and in fact, Mort Saul, the comedian, made a point of saying, he would go into that sauna and he would have a huge tumbler of scotch sitting in the sauna. <laughs> and he was uh. just sort of, couldn't believe his eyes with this. And other people commented, yeah, he'd go into the sauna to clean up and he'd go in with, with, with beer. He'd be sitting there in the heat. Uh, and that seemed like, you know, quite an amazing feat to pull off there. And a, and a sad one too, because clearly there was a serious addiction going on there. It's, I think everybody, if he knew it, he wouldn't admit it, and everybody in the family clearly knew there was a problem. <laughs> well, he, it, it's interesting though, because he also felt, he, he, knew, he knew he drank too much, but he was also painfully shy, and he really struggled with the whole celebrity thing, or celebrity artist being a movie star, whatever you want to call it, and because he was, he was really uncomfortable being in crowds. I mean, I'm not saying that just be, to be warm and fuzzy. It's like he really was. And he would, even later in life, you know, we, I would go with him to a dinner party and he would like, he'd be like, don't leave me, don't leave me. This is when he's in his 70s. I mean, he, he just, he didn't, he didn't love it unless he was really comfortable with the people. Mm. And, you know, I think that was a lot of it. I mean, I think that had a lot to do with it. Where was he most comfortable? At home, behind the wheel of a uh, high-powered uh, sports car, or uh, on a movie set? Where do you think he felt most at ease? Well, definitely, definitely in a race car. Loved, loved driving. He loved the people. 
you know, on the track. He loved all the drivers, you know, the, the engineers. He, he just, he loved that kind of traveling circus kind of, you know, I mean, he loved it, it was just being with the boys and, you know, they, they had a lot of fun and they treated him just like another driver, which to him was, you know, he kind of get, get peel off that, you know, Paul Newman Star. thing and, you know, become this other person, which was fantastic for him. And the other place that he loved being, you know, more than anything really were the camps with the kids. I mean, he, he, I mean, that to him was, was kind of like the perfect storm of everything good in the world. Um, meaning, you know, children are so inspiring, innocent and inspiring. And he loved, as hard as it was for him being around so many children that were so ill, their ability to just get back to being a kid and not wallowing or, or you know, really even thinking about their illness. Their whole um, focus was just the joy of being a kid and being able to get back to being playing and, and having fun, and he loved that. I mean, he would, he would spend weekends. We would go to the camp and stay. We had a little cabin, you know, a couple of, like right in the front of the property, and he just, we would go there, and he would just go and hang out with the kids all day, and he would, you know, eat lunch with them and fish with them and, you know, go ride, and, and he loved it. I mean... That His was, kids, that of course, was, had no idea he was a celebrity or a famous movie star. Generally, they just knew that he was the, you know, the guy who started the camp, and of course, you know, the the guy on the lemonade carton, which was, <laughs> which which was very confusing for some of them, and that is possibly one of my favorite stories. Do I, I? So, so dad was going to have lunch with, you know, with campers. And there's about, um, during our sessions and at all of our camps, we have 30 camps and programs all over the world. But in those days, there were about 100 children at camp at once. And so dad, there were like little picnic tables. And so dad sits down, and at each end of the picnic table, there's the carton of, you know, lemonade, pink lemonade. And, and, you know, regular lemonade. And so they were sitting down. He's sitting with this, this little cabin of little boys. And, this little, and they were talking about what they've done during the day. And this little boy looks at him and then looks at the carton and looks at him and looks at the carton and finally says, are you Paul Newman? <laughs> Dad said, why, yes. Yes, I am. And he said, are you missing? <laughs> and poor dad, you know, it took him a minute. So he was like, what? And, like, and he looked at the card and he was like, oh no, 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 no. This is, this is my, uh, this is my lemonade. I make this lemonade and this little boy was having none of it. He was like, no, 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 this is really serious. <laughs> Anyway, that that's that was his what that was his happy place. So, I think it's it's certainly worth noting too. Clea now oversees the whole uh, camps, uh, the hole in the wall camps, and as you said, but there there are how many now? Thirty. There are thirty camps and programs all over the world now. Um, we have we have fifteen camps. Um, we have nine in the U.S., uh, five in Europe, one in Israel, oh, and one in Japan. It's a smaller program. And then we have what we call our partner programs in India and Africa and Latin America for children specifically with HIV. And we serve about 160,000 children and their families globally, um, all free of charge. So, <laughs> Which is a, a great good thing, to say the least. I mean, it My was happy place, too. Well, it's, you know, there was a review the other week um, in the New York Review of Books by the actor Simon Callow, who's also a writer, and uh, he was very taken uh, 
with your dad's devotion to charity, both to you know creating Newman's own products and also the camps and uh, what I think the number he cited there and the various different numbers is so far uh, the businesses have created $540 million for charity, which may make him actually the largest um, uh, private donor to uh, to charity in the country who's not a, uh, a a Bill Gates or something, some, some incredible statistic. But he wrote this, if you'll permit me there. How many similarly privileged people could have done this and didn't, or don't? It was, of course, self-healing, tormented by his own failures as a parent, above all the death of his son. Paul focused on tragically afflicted children. Do you think that that was part of the thing, that this was his way of uh, both not just giving back, but also atoning, if you will. I used that word before, that this was the way of redemption. And, and it worked, it seemed. It really seemed to uh, take so much pride in that, and pride that he couldn't find in some ways anywhere else, it seemed. Or, um, I, yeah. Or is it? <laughs> I, well, no, I, I, no, I think it... Um, you know, he started the Scott Newman Center... Uh, after Scott passed, and it was supposed to educate children on, you know, drugs, and he started out in California, and it was um, it was pretty successful, but it was, you know, once we kind of all moved back to the East Coast, it continued to do really good work, but it really wasn't making, um, it wasn't moving the needle. And I think that shortly after that, not shortly after after we all moved back kind of full time to to the East Coast, uh, we had a very close friend who passed, got cancer. It was this big strapping sailor. He was roughly my father's age. Um, we were they had three kids. We were three kids at the time, and we were all very close. And when he got sick. He passed away very quickly, um, and he was treated in a local hospital. And back in those days, you know, there weren't pediatric wings, and so we would all go and visit him. And invariably, there would be, you know, a little girl with leukemia right next to, you know, an older person who had, you know, prostate cancer, and then, you know, whatever. So it was just everyone was on this one wing, and Dad. And all of us, I think, were so taken aback about how kids who get sick really get the short end of the stick because they don't have enough time to live a full life and or you know be a kid. And I think that affected Dad so much. And that was kind of his aha moment that he he wanted to create a place where kids could get back to just being a kid, hmm. and this was his way of, you know, he, he tried teaching kids about, about um, drugs and didn't feel like he could, he could really move the needle, but in this way, he really felt like he could. And, you know, he, I think what was amazing about it is that once he figured out what he wanted to do, the amount of time that between when he found the property and when we had our first kids at camp. I mean, think about it. I don't know how, how you guys have felt about doing any construction or whatever, but you know, <laughs> most people it takes 18 months to do their bathroom. Dad, <laughs> well just, you know, because it's, comp it's not easy. Um, Dad found the property, built 54 buildings, and this had this property had nothing on it. Um, built 54 buildings, got a medical director, hired all the staff, and had our first kids at camp, and created the program because there had never been one before. So, for him, it was it was a desperate need to um, help. Help. Well, not just help, but fix a problem that he felt, he, or not fix a problem, but help fix a problem that he thought he could move the needle in. So, pretty amazing. 
we've talked a bunch about how he was as a father uh, to, uh, to his children. How is he as a grandfather in his later years? <laughs> he was, he, he, well, both my parents, I, I mean, they, to the horror of my parents, you know, all of us were late bloomers. We didn't get married till we were late. You know, none of us had children except for my middle sister. So I'm the youngest. Lissy got married and had two boys. And I mean, it was, it was a marvel to watch. I, it just because it was so much fun. I, they, mom and dad had so much fun, but for dad, especially when Peter was born, um, he, it's like he could, he could do all the right things, you know, and, or that he felt were, were right. And he, the funniest thing was um, the amount of time that he would spend with Peter, as did my mom, but, you know, they, my sister moved into the house directly across from the house they, they, my parents lived in, actually moved into the house that we grew up in. And so Pete and Henry, Henry came shortly after Peter, um, would come over and visit anytime they wanted. So they would just show up at the house unannounced anytime, you know. And so dad, and I witnessed this one time, which I, I literally burst out laughing. And I think the person on the phone actually heard it. Because, and I can't remember who, call, who called, but it was somebody, you know, it, Imp fairly important, and I don't remember who it was. It was, you know, it was like the studio head or, you know, some, somebody that was fairly important, and they were supposed to have a call. And so Dad picks up the phone, and as he's picking up the phone, Peter and Henry come running in the kitchen. And they're like, you know, Papa, you want to come play? You want to come play? And, and Dad's like, um, uh, you know, I'm... I'm very sorry, but it, it seems that I messed up my schedule, and I have a very important meeting right now, so <laughs> it, can we move, can we change this? And I burst out laughing because I was in the living room, and Pete and Henry were like, what, what? And you could hear them in the background. <laughs> so yes, he was an awesome grandfather, and he loved it, he loved it, I mean, even, you know, even in his late seventies, when Henry was little, he would, you know, be crawling around. I'd walk into the house and I'd be like, "Dad, where are you?" And he's like, "You know, I pop." He his head would pop up, and the two of them would be crawling around on the floor. I'm like, "Dad, can you get up?" You know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> there were no rules. Um, can I ask you one more thing? Then we're going to take some questions, actually. Uh, so, I'm sure. There are a number that you would you know, <laughs> like to ask Clea. Um, something actually, the, the, the flip side of this in a way, uh, who did your father think was sexy? <laughs> Male or female? <laughs> yep. He, uh, Since everybody thought he was the sexiest man in the world, if you will. I think People Magazine even said that at one he, point. <laughs> oh, to my poor mom. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, um, no, he, he was on the cover of magazines consistently as the sexiest man alive, even when he was 80, I think. <laughs> in fact, I remember being in, uh, in a, the grocery store and mom saw the magazine and went, oh, for Christ's sake, <laughs> you know, but, um, I would say that mom, that, that dad thought that mom was the sexiest thing there was. And, and I'm not just saying that, and I will tell you one really short, funny story. So, and I apologize, because there's a little smut in it. Um, so so I, I was supposed to get married um, when I was in my early, tw well, mid-20s. And um, so and I was getting a little cold feet, because I was not prepared um, to get married. And so I, was walking with dad, we were on, we we're on Madison, we we're walking up Madison Avenue, and we get to the light, and I looked at dad, and I said, dad, what, what has kept you and mom married all these years? It's really important. 
And he looked at me and he smiled and the light turned and he walked across the street. And I was like, <laughs> so he is walking and I'm like running to catch up and he walks a whole block and he says nothing. So we get to the next light and I'm, dad, this is kind of important, I'm not kidding. And he goes, what? And I said, seriously, like what has kept you and mom married all of these years? And he looked down, smiled and said, lust. Total and complete <laughs> lust. So I've never lusted after any woman besides your mother like that, ever. And I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> so that, I mean, if you're talking about men, it did who dad thought was sexy as a man? The competition, if you will, in terms of movies, in terms of like. Well, I think, you know, Marlon Brando, he, he, I don't know if Marlon, he thought Marlon was next, well, you know, Marlon was pretty sexy. But he, <laughs> um, but Marlon, he thought was extraordinary. But older, I, uh, George Clooney, he thought was very sexy. And he was right. <laughs> Good taste there. <laughs> Good taste. <laughs> Let me open it up to anybody have any questions. Uh, Yes, this woman up here. Hi. I just used to view your dad like he was a wealthy man, like a spiritual basis that he had to the things that he was taking on spiritually as a child. What is that? Um, so my parent. Oh, if okay. so he. Repeat the question. Oh, oh, she asked if dad was spiritual. Um, or uh, do you mean like had a sp specific religious Not so background? Religious. Um, I don't, not really, he, he, so he, he was brought up, his, his father was Jewish and his mother was Christian scientist and he would always say, I, I lean towards being Jewish because I think it's harder. Um, <laughs> he always wanted to do things that were harder, um, but but I do, th I do think as he got older, um, I, I'm not, you know, it's funny, I didn't, I don't think I ever talked to him specifically about being spiritual, but I think he was finding more guidance. And, you know, I don't know how he thought about it in his own mind, but I think as he got older, he was searching for direction, maybe, if that makes sense. This gentleman over here. Um, I don't, did everyone hear that? Um, did, he said, I don't know if everyone heard, he's, he asked if, um, since both of our parents, both of my parents were actors, um, were they, were other actors frequent in our home, and he, a lot, you know, in, in California, um, and some on the, on the, on the East Coast, um, more, more in New York. I would say I have a couple of favorites. Um, so Sidney Poitier is one of my favorite people, um, mostly be because, he, well, he was so charming and his voice was just, I don't even know how to, it just was like a, well, mass, yes, but more like, like butter. <laughs> butter. Um, but he was, truly one of the most beautiful men I've ever seen in my life. I mean, just, he, um, I met him the first time when I was probably eight and I did a quadruple take, that's what my mother said. <laughs> um, but, and, and, and Redford, you know, just because I grew up with him and his family. Um, and interestingly, he was the first person that I ever had a serious, like a really serious conversation with that wasn't my parents when I was little. 
and he recounts it because he thought it was so interesting. I was six, and I had about an hour conversation with him about God. So, there. <laughs> go, go figure. Go, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the last conversation yeah. you had about God? I think? No. Just kidding. This woman here. Yes. Sorry. I don't know. The woman on the left. We'll, then, then we'll go. Yes. You, you mean uh, you mean being blacklisted? Um, uh, so I haven't seen the Philadelphians in a really long time. So I'm trying to like. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now it's coming back. Sorry, it took me a minute. Um, well, I, yeah, I mean, now it's, thank you for reminding, it's been, a, it's been a little bit, and he does have a lot of films, so sometimes. Um, <laughs> But no, yes, I totally, I agree with your, um, the Philadelphians was definitely kind of his, his beginning journey, I would say. Um, and I think for, for me specifically, Nobody's Fool is probably one of my favorite films, mostly because, um, it's so him, and I think he got to have all the conversations that um, that maybe he wanted to have with his son on camera, and he got to be that. You know, I he luckily he actually got to be a grandparent, but he he got to live vicariously through that character and um, yeah that's it, it's funny that's one of the films that I love the most but it's really hard for me to watch now yeah I don't but and and yes he did he had a, he had a, quite a few friends who were blacklisted um, and uh, there was actually a lot of talk about that um, when I was little Anyway, there's one in there. Uh, well, there's oh. there's a gentleman in the back that oh. has been. No, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Quirky.
Um, okay. No, no, no. They actually, so um, I'll tell you a funny, funny story that's probably not out there, mostly okay. because there was nobody there but us. <laughs> um, is bef when Letterman did the um, Academy Awards and Dad was getting... We're not big award family, so I can't remember which award this was. Sorry. Some award. Oh, that's the one he loved. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, we so we we were supposed to walk the red carpet, and um, Dad decided he didn't want to walk the red carpet. So he so we went back and we hung out with Letterman, and. In, in his, you know, in his trailer, and we had so much fun. And Dad finally looked at him and he said, "You know, you, you got to go do the open." And Letterman looks at him and he goes, "Why can't we just hang out here?" <laughs> and you know, Dad's like, "Well, I kind of want to leave, actually." <laughs> but they they were really good friends, and um, Dad was the one who pulled Letterman into race cars. And, and Letterman's now a, a part owner and a team, and then um, they, yeah, they, they had a lot of fun together. You're welcome. Oh, wait, this gentleman, hold on. Oh, wait, sorry. Dealer's I, you're, choice. You're, you're, you're so, so <laughs> sorry, he's been. <laughs> the Verdict is one of my favorite films, because he plays an alcoholic lawyer in that, and he plays it really well. <laughs> was that after he sort of straightened himself out, or was um, that was that was kind of a little after, um, but if you notice all of the quirks, all of the things, the banaka, all that stuff, that was dad. That actually wasn't written in the script. So all of those, um, and it's interesting because that's in the book too. Um, but in he talks about it a lot, um, as did as did the director. Sidney Lumet, yeah. I also read something about Sidney Lumet. I'm trying to believe this. Thought he was phony in his performance at first, and he really got on, and then he got really serious about the role. But yep. <laughs> and I he, think in the book, there's a conversation with Lumet where he talks about this very frankly, and clearly uh, he shopped. Paul by telling him this, and he got the message, and the next time he came into rehearsal, he was a different man, apparently yeah. called on that he wasn't quite giving of himself as much as he should have been. Yeah. It's extraordinary. We have time for one more question, I'm told. So this woman's been waving, I'm sorry, for forever. <laughs> Why? So she she said, "Why did the Why did Dad destroy the audio tapes?" What do I didn't hear? Oh, um, so actually, he didn't destroy all the trans, all the um, the audio. He actually there. He destroyed some of it, and it's a funny thing because he actually went to the dump with my sister, and they took a bunch of the tapes there and and took them to the dump. Um, there, there were actually a, quite a few other tapes. I mean, significant number, but they were done in those old tapes. You know the old, um, you know the recording ones that we all use. Well, you may not remember. Real to real but, cassette. Right. Yeah. Is that? Um, and they were really small, and so they they kind of just disintegrated. So not completely, but they you know they're they're not audible, or some of them are, but it's very hard to understand. Um, all the transcripts were saved, and which was surprising because, um, you know, David recounted the craziness of, of finding them. We knew that they existed. We didn't really know where they were. And it wasn't until my mom's house was being painted, this is after my father passed away, and it was probably 
uh, it's so hard with COVID. I feel like I can't remember time, but, but it was it was probably like a year, little year and a half, maybe before COVID, and um, the, we you know we'd taken everything out of the house, and mom was in the living in the apartment in New York, and we were painting the whole house, and we, there was a bunch of stuff stored down in the laundry room down in the basement. And we were moving a bunch of paintings and things like that. And behind the paintings, there were two huge file cabinets, locked file cabinets, with all of the transcripts, like perfectly organized. But what's crazy about it is that Dad's was not there. <laughs> so there were 13,000 pages. All told, probably. In total? Yeah. So it was like, I don't know, 10, 10 11,000 pages of transcripts. And, but we couldn't find dad. So my best friend, Emily, um, was reading through all of them. She's a producer. She's the one who produced um, the docu-series uh, with Ethan. And anyway, it wasn't until right during COVID that we were moving stuff and storing stuff in mom's storage unit. There's like a whole bunch of storage rooms in, in Westies. Um, and we, she was moving boxes around, and in two boxes, it says PLN history. And those were all of Dad's transcripts. So it's interesting, and, and it's very, like, in big black, you know, writing. And so I, it's pretty clear that he wanted them saved, you know? And, and it's actually in his will that in his words, because of course dad, again, being tough on himself, he says in his will, if there's ever any interest, you know, in a, in a memoir or, you know, I'd be okay with that. It's like literally what it says. And it's interesting because in the interviews, it's pretty specific about how I'm doing this for my family and to, you know, dispel the fairy tale. Um, I won't lie and say it was a complicated decision. You know, when, um, I don't know if any of you have read the book, but, you know, it's, it's pretty heavy. And it's um, very raw and, you know, it makes me feel weepy thinking about it. Um, it was it was a tough decision, but I don't have any questions. Honestly, if if he want, didn't want it done, because it's very clear, um, it doesn't mean it was easy, because it was a tough decision. You're welcome. On that note, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>